OK, so we're going to get started. I'm going to hold off on roll uh, because we're going to try to, and I'm still checking with Chuck to make sure all of the logistical challenges work out. But at 10.30 today, we're going to try to have all of you step away from the computers, unlock the whole lab, and then have you all lock, log back in so you don't have to do that welcome to Windows and all that stuff, OK? W in which case, I will assign seats based on seat numbers and all of that sort of thing. So hopefully, you already have the seat that you like because that'll be your seat forever. Uh, at least for this class. But that's something we have to do so that you don't have to deal with all of the first time startups and, and whatever. So anyway, we will deal with that a little bit later today. Uh, but that also means don't leave early. right? Make sure you're sticking around so that that can happen. Um, before we get started, first thing I want to do is I want to apologize about the website last class. I did do some investigations with my uh, server provider that's down in LA. And it turns out it had nothing to do with me. They had a massive denial of service attack on their network that caused all of their computers basically to crash. So it had nothing to do with us. I thought you guys did it and brought it down, but you didn't. Um, so everything should be working fine at this point uh, because we should be OK. We're going to talk about internet and security and stuff today anyway, so it's kind of uh, appropriate. But before we get started too much, I want to talk through your first comments just so that you see kind of how the commenting system works, et cetera. So I've gone ahead and I've logged into the course website. You will, before you write comments, please make sure that you log in. Technically speaking, you can comment without logging in, but it won't track you as commenting. So since I want to give you credit for it, log in first, and then it'll track you. Um, I'm going to go ahead and go to the Student Work tab. And we're obviously in Architecture 135. I'm going to go to Exercises and then Exercise 101 to display a list of all the posts that you guys made. Remember, they're reverse chronological in order. And I would s scroll through and say, oh, this one looks interesting. Um, you know, Maybe I like the materials on this building or what have you. Uh, and so what I'll do is I'll look at the post. Maybe I'll read it. That would be helpful. right? And I'll come down here at the bottom. And it says, comments zero right now. Submit a comment, minimum of 25 characters. Okay, That means I can't say. Nice. Post comment. Right? It's going to say, nope, you can't do that. Okay? So no, no lame comments. We're going to do good comments. Okay? So I might say something like, um, I think the materials used on this building provide a nice juxtaposition and level of interest on the facade, or something like that. Right? I'm trying to create something that's, that's interesting and useful for somebody. Okay? Once I've done that, you see down here, it's commenting as me. That's good. Right? I can choose if somebody else comments, I want to be notified and be part of this conversation or not. Chances are you don't want to be. You just want to submit your comment and walk away, and that's fine. And I'll go ahead and click on Post Comment. Now, once I've done that, okay, for me, it's going to show up right away because I've already commented before. So there it is. It shows up with my little picture and me, et cetera. Okay, for you guys, if you've never been in this class before or you weren't in 136, it won't show up right away. And that's a spam filter thing. It will kick to me. I have to manually approve it for the first time. So don't panic when you do your comment today and it doesn't show up right away. Okay, first time. I have to say, yes, it's OK. And then from then on, it'll show up right away. Okay, So I want you to do one of these comments for the first post. You don't have to do three. Just do one. Okay, But I want to make sure that everybody does the comment first, uh, or you know, does the comment today. It works, and all the rest of it. Okay, The other thing is um, you should get in the habit of when you get into class at the start of class, sit down, log in, write your comments for the day before. Okay, so if you get in the habit, you write three comments when you first sit down. Maybe on a day where there was an assignment due the class before, maybe you write six comments instead of three. If you do that, you'll basically always be caught up and you won't have the big backlog of comments to try to catch up on at the end of the semester. Okay? S about a third of you will do it in the beginning, right? And then a few of you will drop off and not do it. And then everybody will be panicking by the end. Okay, that's just the way it works. So I'm just trying to help you out along the way. So if you get in that habit, life is easy. Okay? There's always a handful of people that do it that way, and they never, they never run into problems down the road. So that's commenting uh, on the course website. So we're going to continue today. So 
All right, let me get to the top of this here. And we're going to talk about technology, design, architecture, kind of all the related things that aren't truly what this class is about. And I can't help myself because we have to talk a little bit about some background information um, to kind of get set. I mean, this is a computer class. You're here in a computer lab. For some of you, this is your first college computer class. For some of you, it might be your first college class ever. And so I'm here to try to impart some general knowledge on you besides just the Adobe Creative Suite, uh, AutoCAD, and um, SketchUp. I'd like to, to give you a little bit more than that. And so we're going to talk general computer philosophy for a little bit. Uh, and we'll spend today kind of wasting our time talking about that. Uh, and then we'll move into digital photography next class and kind of start the ball rolling. I've done this lecture where it's been at the end of the semester. And I've found that it's far more effective to kind of front load it and put it at the beginning so we can have this dialogue first. Uh, there's a lot of things that I'll talk about that I think are particularly relevant for you going forward uh, in your career as a design student. And so I want to make sure we kind of talk through that. The first thing we'll talk about today is how do you organize your digital life? And this has to do with the files on your computer. It has to do with your emails. It has to do with your calendars. All of that stuff kind of in a nutshell, which is essentially being a student. Or maybe we could say being an adult or adulting if we're millennials or whatever. Right? Some of you are probably in the millennial category. There's probably something after that now, but whatever. I'm old is what it is. So let's talk about how do we organize our files. And we'll start with files first as I trip over my own courts. This is certainly a way of organizing your files. And we can start by just having a very flat file system, which basically means we have a big folder. Let's call it the Documents folder. And we throw all our stuff in our Documents folder. right? Maybe it's like my wife. This drives me nuts. And you get onto her computer, and everything's stored on the desktop. You can't see anything. It's just all files. And it's like, really? That's what, how do you find anything? But for some people, that works. right? And so that is certainly an option. I'm hopefully going to talk you through or talk you out of using that as your primary option. But you might have something like this, where you have a documents folder as your primary folder right there. right? The documents then leads to maybe you want to be a little bit more organized. So we divide it up into general programs. Maybe it's Illustrator. Maybe it's Word, something like that. Does this sound familiar to somebody? in this class. okay, it, it works. It's an organization structure. There are, however, some fundamental problems with this. And that is that it's really hard to keep your projects separate. Okay, Let's say you're, you're, you're writing an English paper, you're writing a history paper, and you're writing some kind of a response for 121. And they're all Word documents, and they all end up in the same folder. You have to remember, how did I name that file? Where'd it go? Right? And that can be a, that can be a big problem. It is easy in one sense because all your Word files are in the same folder. right? All your files are in one place. Well, it must be in this folder somewhere. Okay? But you might have 100, 200, 1,000 files in this folder. And you've got to look through every one like, what did I remember? How was it named? And that can be a big problem. right? It wastes time. So folders are really large. And that's, a, that's definitely a challenge related to this. So maybe instead, we set up some kind of a hierarchy where we divide up and we categorize where things go. Okay, so for example, right, maybe we'll look at something like this. We have a Documents folder. Right, there it is. That's our big bucket. Okay. Below that, we have something called School. And we have something called Personal. Maybe we'd have another folder called Work. It's not a bad place, depending on what we were doing. And then inside of School, maybe we would have various classes. Right? I'm in 131. I'm in uh, 135, whatever it is. Okay. Then inside of that, maybe uh, we have, so in this case, I had 135. We go up here. I have assignment one. I have exercises. Right. I'm organizing it. So maybe I have assignments, all the assignments. I have exercises. All the ex exercises go in there. Right. So if you organize in this sense, it's really easy to find where your stuff is relating to a particular project. And I think this is one of the things that's very important in the world of design, because when we create stuff, we don't create one Word document. right? Let's say we're working on a 220 final project. We might have an AutoCAD file. We might have a Rhino file. We might have 10 different renderings. We might have a few Illustrator files. right? We've got all kinds of stuff that goes into this particular project. If we keep all that project together, it's very easy. 
uh, and therefore it's a big advantage. So I'm working on a particular project. All my files related to that project end up in one place. We're going to end up in this class working in Adobe InDesign, which is a layout program that deals with linked and referenced files. So if you move your files around or you don't know where they are, InDesign isn't going to know where to find them to put them in your final document. And that's going to present a problem. So we want to start early with an organization strategy that works for you. Okay? This is obviously still easy to find your files because you know what folder they belong in. Right? I know I'm in 135. My 135 stuff must be in the 135 folder. Right? So I don't need to know that it's an InDesign file or a Word file. I just need to know the class that I'm part of. And therefore, it should be in that folder. Okay? You can also go backwards. You can use the search features on any of these computers to find all your Word documents. If you really want to go back and see, where are all my Word documents? Right? You can create those kinds of folders, or smart folders as they're called, and get the same thing. So let's say you have a flash drive in the computer lab. How would I go about setting a flash drive up in the computer lab? Right? I'd have the root of the flash drive. In this context, I have a folder called Dropbox. We're probably going to switch over to using OneDrive because of Windows 10. You guys all have a 15 gig free OneDrive account via your school email. So you can use that to your advantage here uh, and store 15 gigs of data. Dropbox is limited to 2 gigs unless you refer friends and you know, play some games and whatever and get your, your total up. Um, so the 15 gig is fine. So in this case, I called it Dropbox, but we could call it OneDrive. Doesn't really matter. Right? And then inside of that, we might have a folder for 135 and a folder for any one of the other classes that you might be taking. Okay? Beyond that, we'll take 135. We'll have an assignments folder, an exercise folder, maybe a portfolio or a final project folder. Right? And sometimes this resources thing down here at the bottom can be useful because sometimes you have stuff that you keep, background textures, V-Ray material libraries. I know you guys aren't in Rhino, but this would categorize, this would go in that category. Stuff that isn't really related to a project that you just need to keep. Right? So you might have some kind of a resources folder or something along those lines. So that's how I would suggest that you set up your flash drive so that you have some organization strategy. Right? The other option is, here's my flash drive. I just save everything in the default folder on the flash drive. Right? Not that organized. It'd be nice if we were a little more organized. So the next thing comes with, how do you name your files? Right? And I'm gonna, I already picked up my wife today, so I'm going to pick up my dad now. Okay? My dad is notorious for working on his computer, and he creates something, and he, he's, he's an, he has an accounting background, so he likes to do spreadsheets and stuff. Okay? So he works on a spreadsheet, and he gets to some conclusion, and he says, great, and he saves it. I ask him the next day, well, where'd you save it? What'd you save it as? I don't know. I don't know. It's like untitled 26. It's like, well, how are you going to find it again? Right? So the problem here is if you're naming your files, you want to think about how do you actually name the file. Right? And it's easy. We can come up with basic descriptions. You know, my first project one, my first project two. Okay? But in 10 years, are you going to remember what my first project is? No. Right? So maybe there's a better system. So this is something that I worked on when I was in grad school. Uh, because I needed to keep track of large, big, lots of files, lots of data, and whatever, and I needed a way of keeping it all separate. So I always appended a prefix, or prepended, because it would be in front, a prefix on anything related to a particular class. And I did that by taking the subject architecture, the class number, in this case 121, and then I stuck the, last, the first letter of the last name of the professor as part of it. The reason that I did that doesn't matter so much for you guys, because you're only going to take 121 once. But down the road, you'll be in grad school, and you might take a design studio, a 201 studio, three times. So it's the same course number. So I did this to solve that problem. Do you need to do it? Not really. You could just do A135 for this class, for example. So if you stick that in front of, right, there it is. If you stick that little piece in front of everything related to the class, it's really easy to find everything related to the class. Right? So if we continue along here, right, then we add something at the end of the file. And we'll talk about what goes in the middle in a second. Right? Anybody number their files? Nobody? Nobody's willing to admit it? A few of you? Okay. 
This is classic design student. Okay? We love numbering our files because we work on something, we save it, then we do a save as and we try something else. And then your studio professor says, oh, that was terrible, and you want to go back to the first one, and then you go off in a different direction, and you keep these number processes going rather than just overwriting the file. So I took this a step further when I was in grad school. I have two things. One, I have an addition, and the second thing I have is a version. And so the addition were major changes, big design decisions. I, I went in a different direction. It goes, the number changes, 0, 02, 0, 03, 0, 04, big decisions. Then I added a letter afterward. Right, gives you 26 chances before you have a big, a big addition change to change the version. I do a rendering in Rhino. I get a final product. It looks OK, but I want to tweak one of the settings. The material doesn't look quite right. Instead of just deleting the file that I had, because the new rendering might be worse, I just do a new addition. And so I add A, B, C, D, et cetera. Right? It's just a way of keeping your files organized and knowing what the most current is. Okay? So if I combine it together, I put the beginning part, the A121A, to define this is the class. And then I take the end right there to say this is the addition and the version. And then I put some stuff in the middle. Okay? And I'll leave the stuff in the middle up to you. Right? Something that means something. Maybe it's assignment one. Maybe it's uh, my project. Maybe it's uh, the urban DVC design studio or the rural DVC design studio. I don't know. You come up with something that makes sense to you. Okay? And you put that in the middle. A few other notes on files. And that is that file names get nasty when you have spaces in them if you're going to upload them online. Okay? For, your, for your computer, for these computers, it makes no difference if you have spaces. Right? Operating system naturally sees the spaces, no big deal. But you may have noticed that you've been browsing online. Let's say you were going um, to your bank and you wanted to download a bank statement. Okay? And you look at the actual name of the file, and it has a bunch of percents in it and weird characters and whatever. You've seen that before, maybe? Okay? Those are placeholders for spaces when you upload online. When you type into your search bar, um, let's say at the top of your browser, and you put in you know, I don't know, we're going to look up IP location in a little bit later. If I put IP space location, it doesn't go to IPlocation.com. It goes to Google and says, what are you looking for? Because there's a space in it. So browsers and the internet doesn't recognize spaces. And so it's important to eliminate those should you want to upload your files and should you not want a bunch of random characters part of your files. Okay? So it's just something to be aware of. It's kind of your own preference. You can, of course, use dashes or underscores. They're very popular, uh, and that's fine. Stay away from other characters like question marks, forward slashes, backslashes, because those all have to do with file systems and characters um, and, and that sort of thing. So I would avoid those as well. So let's talk about backing up your files. How many people have a backup of their files right now? Yes. I like you already. OK? A few of you else. OK? What, were, what would happen right, if your computer fell out of your truck window and it broke open? Would that be a bad thing? Yeah, it would be bad because you'd lose your computer, but what if you lost all your data too? Okay? Believe it or not, my, truck has flown out, my um, computer has flown out of my truck window. Happened to me. Right? Not this computer, an old one. So, if we start talking about backing up, there's a, there's a principle called the 321 backup. Okay? And this is something that I didn't come up with. It came from the Pixel Core, which is a group of multimedia artists. It's a guild of, of artists in San Francisco. And they say you need to keep three copies of anything that you're working on. Okay? So we'll take three. There's a primary working copy. That's the one that you're actively changing and editing. And then there's two other backup copies that need to happen. So three total copies. We take those three copies, and we need to have those three copies in two different mediums. Okay? So something that lives on your hard drive in your computer would be one medium. Right? It's on a hard drive. Something that lives on a flash drive, it's different. Therefore, it's, it's a different medium. It's a little tricky in this day and age. It used to be really easy. A hard drive had some spinning plates on it and was stored magnetically. A flash drive was stored electronically in flash memory. 
Okay? Well, most of our laptops now have flash memory in them anyway. So it's, it's a little tricky because is it stored on an actual hard drive or is it stored on a flash drive? I'd be okay if it was on my laptop flash drive and a little flash drive. That would be okay. okay? Even though it's not technically two different mediums. Right? You could put it on a DVD. I don't know who burns DVDs anymore, but it's theoretically possible, right? But generally speaking, it's going to be a flash drive, it's going to be an external hard drive, or it's going to be the, the drive that's on your computer, okay? The thing about this is any media, no matter what it is, can fail, okay? We talked last class about your flash drive going through the wash. Anybody done that? I totally have. I've had three or four go through the wash. It is what it is, you know? Anything can fail, right? I had a student sit in one of the chairs in this lab, turn their legs and snap off their flash drive while it was stuck in the computer, right? This is a week before finals. Happens, right? Happens. So any media can fail. Your hard drive can fail, okay? I like to tell all these stories because it's kind of fun, right? So one semester, I, it was before I moved into that office, I was over on the other side. I was finishing, it was December, and I was finishing my grading. And this was not on, on this computer, it was on an old computer. Um, and I was working on my grading, submit final grades, 30 seconds later, hard drive completely dead. Didn't do anything, didn't unplug it, didn't do anything weird, hard drive dead. Not recoverable, pulled the drive out, hooked it up to diagnostics like I wanted my stuff, mm -mm. dead dead, like really dead. It happens, I didn't do anything, I was just sitting there working on it. I think it was just so happy it was winter break, I don't know. But it's important to think about this because it can happen to you, okay? So the, the last part, so we did three copies of your files, two different mediums. The last one, the one, is that one should not be with you, right? It should be off-site somewhere. Well, the good news is we have all this great cloud stuff now. This used to be hard to do, right? Now it's easy. As long as it's uploaded somewhere and exists on some server somewhere, it's not with you. If your house burns down, Right? Or your laptop flies out your truck window, you're okay. You have that file. And so if you adhere to this 321, you're in good shape and you're not going to lose your file. So I have had students come up to me at the end of the semester. I actually had this. This was about, um, I'd say, 2009. I had a great student and I went through this lecture in the beginning of the semester. I'm like, you got to back up your stuff, blah, 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 blah. And some of you are like, yeah, whatever. Right? And she listened. And she said, okay, I'm going to back up my stuff. And she started backing up her stuff. And this is before the cloud and all the rest of it. She had an external hard drive and she was backing up her stuff. It was, I want to say, four days before the final project. Her par car was in the parking lot. Somebody broke her window, grabbed her laptop. Gone. All her work for the semester, gone. Okay. She came up to me and she said, I'm sorry. I know this is, this is a little weird, but I have to give you a hug. I said, why? What happened? She's like, my laptop was stolen. I'm like, well, how are you giving me a hug? Because your laptop was stolen. That doesn't make any sense, right? I didn't mean I, I know you want to give me a hug. No, I'm kidding. And she's like, no, no, really? I would have lost absolutely everything, but you gave me that lecture in the beginning of class about backing up your files. And I had my external hard drive with me, and I didn't lose that. So I had all my finals. I had everything I needed to, f to finish the semester, right, even though my laptop was stolen. And I'm just really thankful for it. Okay? I don't want your laptop to be stolen. I don't want things to die. I don't want your hard drive to die. Right? But this happens. One of you in this class will have something like this happen this semester. I can almost assure you of that. Okay? So we need to back up. So what do we do? We're in the lab. Okay? Obviously, you can't store stuff on these computers because as soon as the power goes out, it wipes them off. So that's a problem. So what do we do? Okay? So we keep one copy on a drive that goes with us. Let's call it a flash drive or a hard drive. It used to always be a flash drive. Now it's more commonly a hard drive because you need a little bit more space. Right? Then we use Dropbox or OneDrive. Uh, for, for today, we're going to set up OneDrive um, for you. We let the syncing happen. So you do your work. It automatically uploads whatever it is that you're working on to the cloud. Okay? In the case of today, it'll go to the OneDrive. You upload it. When you get home, right, on your home computer, on your laptop, you install OneDrive, right? You let OneDrive copy that file down to your home computer. So, in summary, one file exists 
on your flash drive. One file exists in the cloud, and one file exists on your home computer. That's three locations, or three copies of your file, right? Two different mediums, right? One's a flash drive, one's in the cloud, one's on your computer, right? One is off-site, one is not with you. So it exists, right, up in the cloud somewhere. So we just solved that problem, and we're in the lab. Come on. I, need, I forgot to reset my screensaver. It comes on too fast. Sorry. Oh, come on. It looks pretty, doesn't it? Come on. Yes, yes, OK. Sorry about that. So the other thing is it has to happen automatically, right? If you say, oh, you know what? Every day when I get home from school, I'm going to take my flash drive and I'm going to copy it to my home computer, you won't do it, right? You get home, you flop on the couch, right? You turn on something good to watch on TV. And you're like, oh, I can't take this life anymore. That, that, that Professor Adams is just too much. I can't deal with him, right? Let me turn on the TV for a while, right? You're not going to copy your files. So it has to happen automatically, right, for it to happen at all. So you either need to have OneDrive running and have it automatically upload, or you need some, surface, some, some solution to this problem. So let's talk a little bit about options. If we're on our home computer, we have some other options that are built in. If you're on a Mac, you have something called Time Machine, that it just exists. If you're on Windows, you have something very, very similar called Windows Backup that would do it for you if you wanted to. There are, of course, a bunch of aftermarket solutions that are out there that you can use to make entire copies of your drive sync certain files, whatever it is. Um, I use something called ChronoSync a lot to do a bunch of synchronizations between my various drives and, and what have you. The point is there's a bunch of options that are out there, and you can use any one of them. But the, it has to happen automatically in the background. That's the critical part. Okay. If you want to back up online, obviously you can have Dropbox, you can have OneDrive. I told you you all have 15 gigs free as a student, so that's not bad. Uh, Google Drive gives you 15 gigs free, though it's really chunky to work with in the lab. So I've tried a variety of solutions that it just never really works in these computers. So I don't like it, but some people do use it. Dropbox will work. There is a Dropbox portable version that you can run off of a flash drive if you want to stick with Dropbox instead of uh, the, um, the OneDrive. With Windows 10, OneDrive seems to work the best. So that's what we're going to talk about today uh, as your backup solution. Uh, there are a few other ones. Carbonite's out there. You pay 50 bucks a year and it backs up your whole computer completely and you don't have to think about it. It's not bad. Uh, OwnCloud is a, if you have your own server, you can run OwnCloud. It's like a Dropbox or anything except you own it. So it's just the back end software for it. So it's there. And of course, there's a bunch of other ones that are out there that you can, you can work from as well. So obviously, you need to have backups frequently. Right? I probably should change the side to say backup minutely, if that's a word. Right? So you, you basically you always want to backup. That's a good idea. Right? And we can go through this. You see where this is going. Right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay? This one's actually kind of important. Okay? When you finish a semester, you did a bunch of work in this class, you did a bunch of work for 121, great time to make a complete backup of all that work that you did and put it somewhere safe. Because you'll be going down the road, you'll be applying to Berkeley, you'll be applying to Cal Poly, uh, and you want to go back and you want to update your portfolio, you want to rework a project, you want to be able to go back and find that particular project. Right? There were a few projects that I did way back when I was an undergrad, I don't have anything left from them. And I would really like to go back because they were pretty cool projects. They're gone because I didn't save them. Right? So make a backup. This is actually one of the few moments when putting it like on a DVD ancient technology, right? Might not be a bad thing. It just exists on a bookshelf somewhere. Okay? So think about it. Maybe. Right? And then yearly is kind of the same thing. And then we can talk about off-site peace of mind. Okay, so we've talked about the doom and gloom, your laptop gets stolen and all the rest of it. Okay, let me present an option to you. And uh, this is a true story. Okay, this is something that happened to my wife when she was in high school. She grew up in the Central Valley. Uh, in Yuba City, which is north, about 45 minutes north of Sacramento. 
And so she was out of the country uh, during winter break. Um, she was, I think, in Germany at the time. And she got a call from her stepdad. And her stepdad said, I have 30 minutes. What would you like out of your room? The levee's going to break. And it's either going to flood our side or it's going to flood Marysville. You have 30 minutes to tell me what you want. So think about your life right now. If you had 30 minutes before you knew your house was going to be destroyed or burned to the ground, what would you take? Think about it. What would you grab first? Right? right it's interesting. It's an interesting exercise. Okay? So what would I grab? I'd grab my laptop and I'd grab my big Drobo external hard drive bay, right? And I'd be running out of the house with those two things because I'm safe, right? Those are the things that matter most. Of course, I'd grab my kids first, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I had 30 minutes. I figured I could get them too. Maybe the dogs. No, I'm, I'm kidding. So the point is that you want to think about this before you're faced with that challenge, right? Turned out that it didn't flood. It broke on the other side, and Marysville flooded, and my, my wife's stuff was fine. You know, I think she said, I want my yearbooks or something like that. She was in high school. You know, yearbooks are important. Right? Looking back on it, it's like, well, maybe not. Anyway, you want to think about this. So I'm going to tell you another ridiculous story. So I would say that one of my most valuable treasures in life is all the photographs that I've taken. All right, you guys will see when we get into the photography section. I like taking photos. I've always liked it. It's fun. Okay? I have, I have a daughter, I have a son, right? Their photos of their birth, photos of them growing up, right? Those are all kind of precious to me, okay? I would argue that they're one of my most valuable things. So what do I do? I make backup copies of these, right? And I used to burn them on a bunch of discs. It was like 40 DVDs or whatever, because there's a lot of them. There's like 50,000 photos or something like that, okay? And now I just start putting it on a hard drive, and I go, this is only happens because it's manual. It only happens every six months, every year or so, right? I make a copy. I put it on that hard drive. I go to my bank. I open up my safety deposit box, and I put my hard drive in there. Well, guess what? That's pretty darn safe. So if everything else were to fall apart in my life, I know I'd still have those photos, and they'd be safe, right? Furthermore, if somebody were to break into my bank and pry open my safety deposit box, they'd be thoroughly disappointed. <laughs> There's no gold bars. There's nothing fancy, right? It is just a hard drive with some photos on it. But I know that those are safe, and that's what's most valuable to me. So I encourage you, right, while we're going through this, to think about what is it that is most valuable to you, and do you have that safe and protected? Okay? So we will continue, maybe. Talk about calendars. We're shifting gears a little bit. We'll come back to some more doom and gloom in a bit. Okay? So calendars. How many people keep a calendar right now? Right? That's pretty good. That's pretty good. So you're a college student, right? You have a lot of things going on. Probably a good idea to have a calendar and to think about where that stuff belongs in a particular calendar. So might not be a bad idea to have separate calendars, one for school, one for your personal stuff, and one for maybe work. Right? Have them all come into one calendar so you can see how they all overlap. Whenever it's possible to subscribe to a calendar, that's always a good idea too. So if you don't manually have to put in the information, all the better. So in this class, there's a calendar that says what's going on and when stuff is due. And there's a calendar feed that you can subscribe to. So I'm going to ask you all today during the exercise to subscribe to the calendar feed and have it show up on your calendar. It's really easy because if I change something, if I change a due date, it automatically updates to your calendar. And you always have the most current version. You don't have to worry about something going wrong. Let's say you're, you really like certain sporting events. right? You follow a certain basketball team, whatever it is. You can subscribe to their game schedule calendar. right? That can show up on your calendar. You always know when game time is. Many, many companies, services, et cetera, have calendars relating to their business. There's no reason not to take advantage of that. Okay? You obviously also want to make sure that your calendars sync to the various devices that you use. Right? If you're in the Apple ecosystem, you want to make sure that whatever calendar you're using works on your stuff. Right? If you use Windows, if you use Android, you want to make sure it all syncs. Right? Or heaven forbid, you mix and match. Right? You've got to make sure it all works. And so we're going to make sure that that works today, we hope. Okay? 
So the good news is there's a bunch of online free calendars. Most of you already have them because you either have a Google account, a Yahoo account, or an Outlook account, right? How many people do not have one of these three? Right. So I hit the big three. Okay. So assuming that I hit the big three and there are those those big three, Google, Yahoo, Outlook. I mean Yahoo. I don't know what's going to happen with them, but anyway, that's a separate subject. All of them talk to all our devices, right? So it doesn't matter what device you have. You can, you can connect that to your device. If you have an iPad, you have a, uh, an Android tablet, that's fine. It'll connect to those. If you have uh, an iPhone, you have an uh, Android phone, it'll connect to those. Windows, Mac, it doesn't matter, right? So we can use those as kind of the universal syncing tool to make sure it goes to all of your devices. If you're in the Mac ecosystem purely, you can use iCloud, right? But here's one of those problem ones where you branch out, you can't touch Windows, you know, so that's a problem. So it is there, but it's, it's very device specific, which is why I encourage the other ones. I even use these. I don't use the iCloud, even though I have all the Mac stuff. Okay? So this is your Google Calendar. This is a, essentially what I'm talking about. You subscribe to the calendar. All our lectures will show up. It'll tell you what's coming. It'll show you when the due dates are and that sort of thing. Okay? Some stuff isn't on the calendar yet. The due dates of the assignments aren't there yet because I haven't decided when they're going to be due. Right? But the lectures are there, and you can subscribe to those lectures. There is a separate feed for this class and for my other class, so you won't see both unless you're in both classes. And so it, it's essentially the same thing. It looks a little bit different if we go to Outlook Calendar. Right? It's still a calendar. Believe it or not, you probably know what a calendar looks like. Right? Yahoo wanted to look a little cool, so we changed the color of the background. Whatever. So it's still a calendar. Okay? And so we'll talk through how do you actually subscribe to these calendars. Okay? So let's talk a little bit about email. Okay? You all have an email account. No surprise. Okay? How many people get 10 emails a day or more? How many people get 20 emails a day or more? How many people get 50 emails a day or more? How many people get 100 emails a day or more? How many people get 200 emails a day or more? How many people get 300 emails a day or more? Sucks. So how do we deal with that? Okay. So let's look at some statistics. The average person has three email accounts. One that they give out to their friends and their family. Right? This is the sexy hot daddy123 at gmail.com. That's not my. They have one for work or school, right? G Adams 407 at DVC. You know, you get that one, right? And maybe they have one other spam account that they use for some other purpose. Okay? So, three email accounts, right? The number of emails sent by humanity each day, and this is a little out of date, it's more than this now. 196.3 billion emails a day. It's a lot of email. Right? The average person sends and receives about 121 emails a day. Okay? It's a lot to keep track of. So what do we do about it? How do we, how do we get through it faster? Okay? So a couple things. One, you don't want to have lots and lots of accounts that you're trying to deal with. Right? You want those accounts to be consolidated. And what happens is early on, okay, let's say you're, you're 16, 17, uh, maybe you're younger than that, uh, and you talk your parents into, oh, I want an email account, and you know, they say, okay, fine, you can have an email account, and you set up something. Okay? It's probably not the, that's the one that's the, you know, uh, I love ponies at gmail.com or whatever, right? It's that email address. You set that one up and you go forward. And then you become a college student and you're like, yeah, I don't really want to give my friends out the I love ponies at gmail.com address. So I'm going to change my email address to be I'm a cool dude at gmail.com. Okay? And so I give my friends out I'm a cool dude at gmail.com and life is good. And then, you decide that you want to go get a job, and you have to type out your resume, and I'm a cool dude at gmail.com might not be the right email for your resume. So you say, okay, well, it's going to be grant.adams at gmail.com, or whatever. That's not my email, but I'm making it up, right? So you end up with a professional email. So you have this track record of these old emails. Well, and you know, you're, you're in college and whatever, and you've got a friend that was a friend when you were 16, and they have your you know, I love ponies at gmail.com, and they want to still email you. So how do you, how do, what do I do? Okay. Well, you can forward 
these old email addresses into your new inbox, your grant.items at gmail.com, your professional email. You can forward those in, and that lets you stop using those old email addresses. You could still keep them open, but you're not going to send email from that anymore. And it's going to convert people over to using your new email address. Right? So you start by forwarding it. Enable your spam filters. Be aggressive about saying this is spam. Right? In your Gmail, you can spam stuff. Right? The better, uh, Gmail I think is the best of all of them at trying to filter out naturally spam. Um, the more you train it, the better it gets. And if you tell it it's spam, it's going to remember that it, it's spam. Uh, and so that's good. Um, you can try to unsubscribe from emails or email lists. It works sometimes. Sometimes it signs you up for more stuff. Right? Most of the time it's OK, especially if it's coming from a, a legitimate company, you know, Pottery Barn or something. You can unsubscribe and it'll, it'll actually happen. Okay? So you want to think about unsubscribing from things. right? And recognize, of course, that there are always spam emails that come through. So those are probably ones you just want to pretend didn't happen and delete them. This is the one that tries to sell you Viagra or whatever. It's probably not a good place to buy it. Okay? So here's simple forwarding. You go into Gmail, you go into your forwarding and pop IMAP setting. Forward an incoming copy of mail to put your email address in. Right? You have to confirm that it's you and whatever. Once you set up that forwarding, you can leave behind I love ponies at gmail.com. Right? You can leave behind one cool dude at gmail.com, and you can just use your good email address. Same thing happens in, in um, Outlook. You can start forwarding, forward to this address, and go from there. Simplifying decluttering. Right? The other thing that you can do that I really think helps is to use a high quality email client. Uh, and it depends on what ecosystem you're working in as to what clients really work nicely. Um, there was a great one called Mailbox that I loved. And then the company went out of business, such as life. Um, but the newest one that I think is pretty darn good, and I would encourage you to have a look at, especially if you, uh, you want to work through your email on a phone or a tablet, um, it does not work on Windows. It's the only problem. Uh, it works on a Mac. It's called Spark. Um, and one of the advantages of an email program like that is it has gestures built in. So you can archive by just swiping. So as you're looking at your inbox, you can swipe, and it'll automatically archive, which is fast. You can also swipe the opposite direction and say, remind me in or snooze until a certain date. You know, I don't want to know about it for a month. I don't want to know about it for a week. And then it'll automatically come back into your inbox, which can be very useful rather than maintaining a bunch of unread emails and whatever. The idea being, you shouldn't have any emails in your inbox. Right? They should either be deferred or deleted. So this is what it looks like. So there's your snooze. You swipe one direction, it'll snooze. Uh, it also organizes um, your emails as they come in into various categories. These are important emails. These are newsletters that you receive. And these are notifications. You know, stuff that isn't that important. So you have these two lower categories that just aren't that important, and you have the ones that matter coming up top. And it's pretty darn good at telling what's important and what's not, uh, which can help. You get the important stuff first. Google Voice is another service that's free that's out there if you want. Uh, Google Voice allows you to get a phone number that you can forward uh, to your other phones wherever you are. You can send text messages to that number and forward those text messages to your real cell phone. So guess what? You didn't actually get my cell phone number in this class. You got my Google Voice number. right? And so that Google Voice number then forwards to my actual cell phone. So it's kind of like a disposable phone, so to speak. right? But it can be very useful for particular purposes. It's free to set up um, from Google. Uh, you can pick your phone number, which is kind of fun. Uh, it gives you choices, and you pick it. Um, you can also set up custom voicemail greetings. So if my wife called, I could say something to her. Uh, as a voicemail different than I would say to you. So something that's out there. Um, the one other thing that's pretty good is if you call me on that phone number and you leave me a message, it will transcribe the message and send me an email of that transcription. So I don't actually have to listen to your message. I can just read what you said. It helps. Anyway, uh, other things like Apple starting to do that now. Anyway. So let's talk a little bit about the websites and, and, and architecture and kind of how to develop an online identity. Okay, So let's talk first at how the internet works. Anybody know how the internet works? 
just this mystical thing that just happens, right? Not quite, okay? So there are a bunch of rooms scattered around the country that are full of equipment that looks like that, okay? Instead of computers like the ones we're used to seeing, Right? They make them really thin and they stack them in racks and they put massive air conditioners in to cool these rooms because they're really hot. Okay? And those exist scattered around the country and they're called data centers. And those computers are what serve up the internet to us. So we need a way of accessing a website. So let's say we're going to Wikipedia or let's say we're going to Digital Tools for Architects. Okay? If I told you that the course website is 202.5.19.97, would you remember that? No. If I told you that the course website is www.digitaltoolsforarchitects.com, would you remember that? Probably. So we have something called the DNS system, the domain name system, that translates this text into the actual address of the server. So in the case of Digital Tools for Architects, 202.5.19.97 is the actual physical address of the computer that serves up the digital tool site. So this system works to get us to those particular computers. We access it via a browser, big surprise. We can use Internet Explorer, we can use Safari, we can use Firefox, we can use Google Chrome, and there is that other browser out there that's called Opera that nobody ever uses, but whatever. In the interest of thoroughness, it's there. Okay. When we're picking a browser, obviously we want to think about certain vulnerabilities that are in a browser, certain speeds, certain features that are part of a browser. Um, generally speaking, Chrome uh, and Safari, which are based on a technology called WebKit, tend to be the fastest at displaying HTML5, uh, which may or may not matter to you. Um, the other technologies aren't quite as good. It is what it is. Right? On these computers, I recommend using Chrome. It seems to play nice with everything. If you're on a, a Mac, Chrome or Safari is fine. Uh, you know, if you really want to use Internet Explorer, you can, but I think it's awful. It's just a personal opinion. Okay? Sometimes you want to add in little plugins or little extra features. So making sure that those features that you want, maybe a password manager or whatever, works with your browser, not a bad idea. Okay? So let's talk about Wi-Fi. So you guys are all here on campus, and you're probably aware that there is a Wi-Fi system on campus, correct? Yeah? Okay. Are you aware that it's not a secure Wi-Fi network? A few of you are nodding. That's good. Okay. So what does that mean? Right? That means if you're here on campus, you're at Starbucks or whatever, and you have things open on your computer like file sharing, right? or you're accessing the internet, theoretically, somebody can access those documents. You would be surprised when I connect to the, the DVC Wi-Fi network how many faculty, I know I'm on the faculty network, how many faculty personal laptops have shared folders on them that I could put files in? It's scary because people are just clueless. Okay? If you're on a public Wi-Fi network, your computer is fundamentally vulnerable. And you just want to make sure that that's in your head. Okay? Obviously, if you go to your bank, you go to Bank of America, you go to Citibank or something like that, you get that little lock icon. You've seen that up in the corner. It turns green, the bar, whatever. Right? You're secure on that. It's an encrypted connection to the bank. You're, you're cool. Nobody's going to steal your bank information. Okay? But anything else that you do that doesn't have that little lock on there, theoretically, somebody could be sitting next to you and actually sniffing the packets and seeing what it is that you're doing. Right? And it, you know, is somebody really going to be doing that? Maybe, maybe not. But you want to be aware that somebody could be. And it might be something that you want to protect yourself in. Right? The big thing is file sharing. A lot of people leave that open on their computers, and it's a, it's a big no-no. Okay? Obviously, SSL connections, that's the one with the little lock. Those are still uh, just fine. Whoops, wrong one. Secure your own network. Right? How many people have a password on their Wi-Fi at home? Right? A lot of you. How many people don't have a password on your Wi-Fi? Okay. Well, if you don't have a password on your Wi-Fi, it's exactly the same as being on DVC's Wi-Fi, because all your neighbors will be on it, too. Okay? Uh, so be aware of that. Use the WPA 128-bit encryption or higher. Usually, that's the default on your router anyway. Uh, WEP was an older style encryption that can be cracked um, using packet sniffing. Um, so just be aware that you want the, the latest and greatest of the security that's out there. So, Sometimes 
you really want to take it to the next level of privacy. And you're browsing at a coffee shop, you're browsing somewhere, and you just don't want anybody looking over your shoulder, you can use something called a virtual private network technology. And that basically establishes an encrypted connection to a server somewhere, and then lets you browse out to the internet from that secure server. Right? And so if, for example, you were, you were doing something where you really just didn't want somebody tracking what you were doing, okay? I won't say doing something illegal, but you were doing something that you just didn't want somebody looking over your shoulder, a service like this would be good. Okay? The other thing about this, and you guys are like, why is he bringing this up? This is borderline a little weird. Right? The other thing about this is it allows you to not be stuck geographically in a particular location. So we're here, we're in California. Okay? In the old days, Spotify only existed in the UK. Okay? Let's say I wanted to listen to Spotify. I'm in the US. Doesn't work. I can't do it. If you use a virtual private network, you can actually have the computer that you're going out from be in the UK, and you can listen to Spotify. So it can enable some geographic locations. Right? Let's say that you want to, you're used to, you're, you're from Italy, and you're used to reading you know, the Italian headlines, and you want the Italian news, and whatever. You can geographically switch your computer using this technology to be as if it were in Italy, and you could see it the way it was when you were at home, which might be an advantage. So there are very legitimate reasons for doing something like this. It's generally a paid service, somewhere 30, 50 bucks a year to have this kind of a service. Uh, and there's a bunch of co uh, companies that are out there that, that do it. So here's the, uh, the, the graphic that kind of illustrate this. I have my computer. I connect to the internet. Okay? If I'm on a public hotspot, whatever is going to and from the internet can be seen. Okay? If I'm at home and I'm on a secure network, right, your, your brain says, well, that's secure. No big deal. Okay? Except for all the people that work at Comcast or work at AT&T or whoever has your internet service provider, they can see whatever you're doing. Okay? So it's not, it's secure from like the weird hacker next door, the creepy dude, right? but it's not really secure. If you're using this virtual private technology, the virtual private network technology, it encrypts to a middleman, to a computer somewhere, and then is anonymous out of that computer because it can't be traced back to you. So that's how it works. Okay, so uh, I'm going to take a quick break before we talk about passwords, and I'm going to show you this live. I hope. Okay, and so let me bring up. Um, I have Chrome brought up here, and I went ahead and I looked uh, at a website called mybrowserinfo.com, and we'll refresh it so that's current. And it says my IP address is 192.235.1.50. Okay, so I'm accessing the internet from there. It says that I'm in California. It says I'm in Fairfield, so it's not perfectly accurate. Okay? And it's telling me that I'm accessing it from Diablo Valley College. Okay? So it, it knows a fair amount of information. Furthermore, it tells me that I'm, I'm browsing on a Mac. right? I'm using the Mac OS X. I'm using Chrome, this version. right? I have a connection speed of 2.8 megabits. right? So all this information exists just because I'm browsing online. So let's say that I wanted to go from where we are to, oh, I don't know. Let's go to Sydney, Australia. All right, so it's going to connect me to Sydney, Australia. And I'm going to refresh this browser. OK, it's now telling me that my IP address is 168.1.53.199, and that I'm coming from Australia. I'm in New South Wales from Sydney. OK. So did I fly to Sydney right now? No. right? But I changed where I'm accessing the internet from. And so if I were to go to a home page like Google, right, it would be as if I were going to Google from Australia. It would be the Australian version of Google. Right? So I get different logos on Google, et cetera. Make sense? So I just shifted where I was geographically by connecting to a virtual private network. Okay? So sometimes the illustration makes it a little bit more real. So we'll continue. Passwords. Right? And I know I told you some days I'm a little bit long-winded. Today's a long-winded day. Okay? But hopefully all this stuff is interesting. So back to some doom and gloom. So Russian hackers now have 1.2 billion passwords that are out there. Okay. What do you think the chances are that one of the passwords that you're using is part of that 1.2 billion? 
probably pretty high, right? They don't even necessarily have to have hacked your particular account, but somebody else who uses the same password, again, highly probable, could have had their account hacked, okay? The average internet user has at least 27 accounts and they only use six and a half passwords for those 27 accounts, okay? Sometimes it's even less. We use the same password for everything, right? Do you think that's a good idea? Probably not, okay? So most normal passwords, name plus year, right? Those kinds of passwords can be cracked in about 90 seconds on a computer, really fast, okay? So do you think you should be using name and year? Probably not, right? Okay, so let's continue. One in 10 passwords is a name plus a year, all right? Two in 1,000 passwords is the word password. Love is the most common verb in a password. It's 12 times more likely than hate to be in the password, right? Most adjectives, the most common adjectives were sexy, hot, and pink in your passwords, okay? I'm not gonna ask if any of your passwords contain that, okay? You're not gonna have to own that one. So the thing about it is the faster the computers get, the better computers are, the faster you can actually crack a password by going through trying each password, okay? So if you have a, a PC running, uh, these, uh, they're using graphics cards because they're, they're more powerful than the, the central processing unit. Um, it can try 8.2 billion password, password combinations per second, right? A lot of passwords to try to get it, okay? The more that are leaked or discovered, the more easy, uh, the easier it is for those passwords to be cracked. Because if you were going to, let's say, put on your um, I'm a hacker hat for a second, and let's say you wanted to try to hack into somebody's account. Would you try using all the known passwords first, or would you start with A, 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 B, A, 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 C? Would you start with the known ones? Probably, okay? So the more that are leaked, discovered, the more people get hacked, all that stuff, the easier it is to find people's passwords, right? So all these leaks that we keep hearing about, you hear them in the news, oh, Target got hacked, LinkedIn got hacked, whatever, right? Those are all passwords that have been leaked. They're known passwords. So if you're using the same known password, you're part of that same list, okay? Or some variation on that. So this is an example of one of the cracking machines, okay? So this particular one can crack uh, an eight digit, um, I think it's an eight digit, yeah, an eight digit random password in about 12 hours, just by applying one letter to the other letter to the other letter. Right? So, yeah, it would take a while, but it can be done. Okay? So, things that are easily cracked. A word that's forward and then backwards. Right? You type it forwards and backwards. Number letter substitution. Super thinkers and super with a bunch of threes and exclamation marks and all that stuff. It's known. Right? That's what, those are the tricks. The tricks don't work. Right? Because they're tricks. Everybody knows what the tricks is. Right? Or any combination of these strategies. If you uh, don't, uh, sorry, don't use the same password twice, right? Two different websites, don't use the same password, right? If it's hacked on one site, hacked on the other site, right? So always use different passwords. Use a password that contains numbers, letters, and characters. You put letters in, you get 26. You put capital letters in, you get 26 and 26, or 52, right? The more characters you have, the harder it is to crack. Okay? Make your passwords completely random. The more random they are, the better they are as a password. If they don't have any words in them, all the better. And you're saying, wait a minute, that seems awful. Okay? So herein lies, don't try to remember your passwords. Anybody use a password manager right now? One of you. Okay? Hopefully, I will inspire you to start using a password manager. Okay? So what a password manager does, and the, the one that I use is 1Password. It's a little on the expensive side, but I've been very, very happy with it. Uh, they usually have sales every once in a while, so you can get on it. Um, what a password manager does is it lets you establish a different, unique password for every website that you visit, and that different and unique password is a random string of numbers and letters, not something that you can ever remember. Okay? And you can specify a length. 
And I actually get annoyed when websites say, no, it, you, you exceeded the maximum length. My default password length is 24 random characters. Okay? It's pretty darn hard for somebody to crack 24 random characters. So I feel very secure, especially on my bank accounts. Right? It is not something that I can remember, nor do I want to type in. So it's important as part of a password manager that it allows you right, to automatically fill in forms. So for me, I'm browsing, I right click, and I say I want to go to this website. It fills in the username and the password, and I can log in. And I don't ever even see whatever that random character is. Okay? There is one password that you have to know, and that is a master password that secures all of your passwords. For that, I would recommend memorizing a random string of like 24 characters. It sounds really daunting. If you type it enough times, you will remember it. Okay? I have a completely random 24 character string that is my DVC um, you know, insight password. Okay? It also happens to be the password that I have to use to unlock this computer. Annoying. Right? So when I first set up that password, I sat down on these computers, I had to type it in, had to get my phone out, had to look at the password, had to copy it letter for letter. It's annoying. Okay? I know it was annoying. Okay? I have that 24 character password memorized now. It's amazing what your brain can do. You type it enough times, you'll remember it. Okay? So you want it to integrate with all your browsers. You want it to generate complex, completely random passwords. And you want to create a separate password for every online account. Okay? If they have a desktop version and a mobile version, that's good. If they're tied to your thumbprint, that's even better. So when I'm browsing on my phone, I don't ever have to type in a master password. I just use my thumbprint, and it'll unlock and fill in the form for me. Okay? So it works very, very well uh, for doing this exact thing and really protecting yourself. Okay? So the other thing that you can do is enable two-factor authentication. My guess is that you've had this happen. You log into Chase, and it says, I don't recognize your computer. I'm going to send you a text message. Sound familiar? Right? That's two-factor. That means I have to have my phone, and I have to get the phone call or the text message, and I have to put in that. Right? Extra security. Much harder for somebody to get in that isn't actually you. Okay? So the one other thing, these are, these are some articles that might be useful relating to this that you can read. They're a little bit old, but it, it gets a lot of the stuff um, put forward. One other thing that I don't have a slide for that's relevant related to passwords is you know how c companies love to ask you, like, what was your first pet's name? Right, the security passwords. You guys, you know this, right? I need to reset my password. Okay, well, there's a fundamental problem here, and that's social engineering. In that, okay, what's your first pet's name? Okay, well, if you've ever posted your pet on Facebook, right, and you talked about what their name was, somebody can figure out the answer to that question, right? You can social engineer the answer to that question. So, those questions by themselves aren't the best answers. So, really, right, your answer to what's your first pet's name should be a random string of numbers that somebody can't guess, right? And if it's stored in a password manager, no big deal. You can just fill in that random string of numbers, okay? So you don't, uh, you know, I don't, I don't like to present this as a doom and gloom, but this is reality. This is the world we live in, and this is the way it is. And so you have to take steps to secure yourself, or bad things are going to happen. Anybody had their identity stolen? Nobody. Good. That's excellent. Okay, so I've given this lecture 10, 10 times, 10 years, 20 times, whatever it is. Okay, you think I'd know something about security, right? Maybe a little bit, a little bit. October twenty fifth, twenty sixteen. Hello. Hi, sir. This is Citibank. We wanted to ask you about your, your recent credit card application. I didn't apply for a credit card. Well, sir, can you verify some information? I don't know who you are. I'm not talking to you. Click. That didn't sit well. 1-800-CITIBANK. Yeah, this is Citibank. Oh, yeah, yeah, here's my account information. Yeah. Yeah, you know, I just got a call that said, uh, you know, they were looking for some credit information. Oh, yeah, sir. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, we did receive an application. Oh, yeah, that wasn't you? Okay, well, that's a problem. Okay, let me transfer you to the fraud department. Okay. 30 minute hold. Fraud department. <laughs> yeah, um, I, apparently somebody made an application, you know, on my behalf. Oh, yeah, sir. Oh, you know, let me, let me check into that for you. Okay. 
Yeah, can you verify your social security number? Yeah, it's you know one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Yeah, that was on the application. And what's your address? Oh yeah, that was on the application too. And what's your phone number? Oh yeah, that was on the application. I didn't make the application. This is weird. Well, sir, let me check your credit report. Sir, did you recently open a Sears credit card? No. Sir, did you recently open a Verizon account? No. Sir, did you recently open a Comcast account in Houston, Texas? No. Sir, did you recently open a T-Mobile account? No. Sir, did you recently open a T-Mobile business account? No. Okay. This happened to me. This exact thing happened to me last year. Okay. It happens to a lot of people. Okay. And I'm really happy that it didn't happen to any of you. But I would rather proactively talk about it with somebody because you guys might never talk about it with somebody. Okay? And this is something that probably in your life will happen to you. Right? The interesting thing as I was talking to a good friend of mine um, uh, two weeks ago, and he was like, yeah, I just had my identity stolen. Like, yeah, welcome to the club. Right? So 9 million Americans each year have their identity stolen. Okay? 15 billion was stolen right, in 2015. Kind of scary. Big business. Okay? It can and absolutely will happen to you at some point. Okay? The good news is there's lots of stuff that happens um, that, that you can put into place that can protect you once it starts to happen. The problem is undoing it. Right? So the people that stole my identity, I have no idea who they were. Okay? They, they did open several cell phone accounts in LA. They used a driver's license to open the accounts in my name. Scary. Okay? Of course, I went to the sheriff and I made the, the official police report and all, all of that stuff. But the point is it happens. Right? And so they were using my credit to try to do this. They got cell phones out of it. Right? I wasn't held liable. I went through all the fraud departments at Verizon and T-Mobile and whatever. I don't even have either one of those accounts. I have an AT&T plan. Go figure. Right? But I had to go through and I had to do a bunch of extra work to prove that it really wasn't me that opened these accounts. Okay? So you want to be aware of this stuff and you want to make sure that you're protecting yourself. So we talked a lot about securing your online identity, strong passwords, all that sort of thing. I did that. Okay? There's my mistake. Right there. I secured my digital world, but I didn't secure my physical one. Right? My mailbox is out at the corner of my house, unlocked, wide open. Right? People taking my mail, they figured it out. Right? They figured out that they could apply for a credit card application using my address and how many days it would take before it would show up and they come back and try to snake it out of the mail without me knowing. Right? That's what happens. So what did I do? Locking mailbox. <laughs> Try that one on. Right? And so since mid-October, right, since the random phone call on Halloween from Discover Loans, did you want to open a $25,000 personal loan? Nope. Right? Since that, I haven't had any of this happen anymore. Okay? So just securing my physical world seemed to have solved the problem. So be aware. Digital world plus physical world. Protect yourself. Okay? The other thing is you want to obviously monitor your bank statements closely. Make sure that you know, weird stuff doesn't happen. You can also go to creditkarma.com for free and check your credit report. I don't know if anybody's ever done that before. Not a bad idea. Right? And you can look for something called hard inquiries. This is where people are checking your credit. And if you have hard inquiries that aren't you, that's th therein lies the problem. Okay. So, let's continue. I told you I was long-winded today. I'm sorry. Okay, branding yourself. We'll go through this rather quickly. Okay. If you don't create your own identity, Google will do it for you. So take a break. Look at your computers and Google yourself. Right now, go for it. Type your name. Type your name. What comes up? I'm giving you full permission, right? Anybody ever done this before? It's kind of funny. So while you're looking at that, 
this is a little bit out of date. I don't think this shows up anymore. But if you Googled Grant Adams, it turned out that I died in a sunbed accident. Crazy, right? You didn't know this was being taught by a ghost. The point is that your online identity is in fact determined by what your Google search results are. Anybody find themselves right away? Good, good. A few of you found yourself. That's good. That's good. I think I played football too, even though I didn't. Right? The point is that you want to start cultivating who you are so that you can right, control that person. So what do you do? If you want to establish who you are, what do you do? Right? You can buy a domain name, or you can start to brand yourself using a universal username in places. But the biggest thing is you want to tie the content that you create with who you are. So if we talk about giving a name, right? this is if you wanted to create your own website, you might try to think of something that was a cool name, that branded who you were. Right? Sometimes it's related to your name itself. Sometimes it's related to something you think is cool. A friend of mine really wanted to buy the name fogmonster.com. And it was a really cool name. And he didn't buy it. And then two weeks later, somebody else bought it. Right? So you can, you can do this. You can register a domain name. If it's memorable, that helps. And I'm going quickly because I've been so long-winded. Okay? So if you wanted to do this, you go to a registrar. You tell them what you want. And they basically, you rent it. You buy it for a certain length of time. Okay? Uh, and then it updates the DNS servers and it points to a computer somewhere. Okay? These are registrars if you want to. You guys have probably seen the ads for the Super Bowl with GoDaddy. They're a big registrar uh, and they like to advertise. So what do you create on a web page? And I'm not going to ask you to actually register your own dona domain name, you know, no grantadams.net or something like that, but we can create a web page using a free service that's called a personal landing page. And what this personal landing page does is it allows you to control, it's kind of like a resume page. It's like, this is me, and this is stuff that I do. Right? So you're branding yourself, you're creating who you are online. And so we're going to use a company called flavors.me to do it. It happens to be a kind of a graphic, nice setup. Right? And it allows you to actively manage your identity, claim things that you do as yours, and associate your name with your content. Okay, so this is flavors.me. We'll go through it. I'll show you the example of it. Uh, I have a tutorial for how you work through it and how you establish this website, um, but it's going to look something like this. And I'm going to go through a bunch of examples. It's the same web page that you're using, same general setup, but depending on what background photo you choose, what font you choose, it can look totally different. Right? So you can see how this changes. It's very, very simple, and it gives you a basic online identity. Okay? Then you need to get your name out there. So you create this personal landing page. How do you get Google to recognize, this is me and this is my content? Well, you associate that web address with your name when you make posts. So on the course website, I'm going to show you how to include this is me, this is my home page, right? this is my LinkedIn page, and these are the posts that I'm making. And that associates, that helps Google say, yes, you are who you are, and this is the stuff that you're creating. So the more posts you make that are like that, the better off you are. Okay? So um, we're going to update your profile in the course website to include your personal landing page. Uh, and that will help make this association. Okay. Quick note on privacy when you're posting stuff online. Right? If you post a photo, say, to Facebook, or you post a photo to Instagram or whatever, you no longer have control over that photo anymore. Okay? And this is one of those moments where it's like, oh, I'm so happy I was in college before Facebook existed. You know? Because if you had a rather less than appropriate photo that was taken of you, right? Maybe you were dressed in you know, tight 80s clothes and were passed out on the floor somewhere. Um, not that that would ever happen to somebody like me. Um, if you had that photo and it existed online, it was tagged as you, 
right? And then you went to apply for a job somewhere, and that job decided to check out your Facebook page, which they do, right? And that was the first photo that popped up. Probably not something you want. So you really want to think about what you post, and is it really appropriate, even if you're trying to post it just for your friends, OK? Because once it's out of your control, it's out of your control. And so I just like to kind of put that out there, because if you're not thinking about that right now, it could hurt you in five, 10 years, right? So think about it now to protect yourself later, OK? So we can, of course, if we have a, a domain name, we can set up emails like grant at digitaltoolsforarchitects.com, uh, which is different than you know, we talked about emails earlier, grant.adams at gmail.com. It can be a little bit more professional if it is, in fact, you know, your name at whatever your address is. Okay? And so you can set up email services and, of course, build your own website at setting up email services, et cetera. The key is that you want to go from user to content creator. Right? The more you make and put yourself online, the more good stuff you do, the more it'll associate with your name and you will become who you are and it'll be obvious that you are in fact you. Does that make sense? So that's really what we're going to be about, uh, certainly in this class, moving forward. Okay. So we'll take a quick break, say 10 minutes. We'll come back at 9.40. We'll do the, um, the exercise 101. We'll start on that. I did get the thumbs up from Chuck that at 10.30, we're going to unlock all the computers. So you need to make sure you're here at 10.30. You also need to make sure that you've finished making any posts for today at 10.30 because the computers are going to be turned off at that point and you'll lose whatever you're working on. Does that make sense? Okay. So we're cutting class a half hour short to be able to do the assigned seats and, and that sort of thing. All right? Okay, so we're going we're gonna to get started. I'm going to demonstrate some of the stuff um, for today's exercise. I'm also shortly going to pass around this pink sheet of paper, which is where you're going to actually sign for what computer you're going to be taking. Okay, So there's a big box that says instructor on it. That's me. right? You guys are all in design. You should be able to figure this out. It goes this way. right? <laughs> um, furthermore, in the little boxes, I didn't write 103 dash the number on your computer for everybody. I just did dash whatever the number is. So on your monitor, it says 103 dash 18 or whatever, make sure that your number matches your box, right? So that we're all clear. Does that make sense? Right? So I'm going to start that going around um, so that I actually have where you're going to be sitting. And I did get confirmation. So at 1030, we're going to you know, unlock all the computers. And I'll walk you through some of the setup stuff. Because of that, I'm going to encourage um, you not to do the OneDrive setup quite yet, because you'll just have to do it again when you um, unlock the computers. If we do it while the computers are unlocked, it will stay there as opposed to having to do it every time. So it'll still ask for your password, but it'll at least save your email and stuff. Okay? So it makes it a little bit better. So uh, on to part two, uh, which is about the calendar feed. Uh, one of the problems that I always have with this is if I try to demonstrate it, I created the calendar. So it's hard for me to subscribe to my own calendar. Um, so I'm going to let you guys do that one. But I do want to point out on the, on the website here, if you go to tutorials and you go to this 0 0.5 calendar feeds, right, it will walk you through how to do it. You're looking for the one that says morning on it, and you want to copy this address. Okay? It it's shows up in a variety of places. It also shows up on today's exercise, uh, if you were to look there. It's right here. Okay. The key is when you copy it, don't have any space in front of it and don't have any space behind it because that'll mess up it adding. Okay. Um, and so I'll let you actually add it. It should be fairly self-explanatory uh, in your in your uh, calendar program. If you have trouble, I'll float around and uh, and I'll help you uh, one on one. But it should be fairly easy. Okay. Um, for part three, you can choose to do it or not do it. It's it's up to you. There's nothing for me to verify as part of that. Um, for part four, I'm going to ask you to create a LinkedIn account. Um, and so you'll end up with a if I can remember my address off the top of my head. Yep, there we go. You'll end up with a resume-like uh, thing. And so I always struggle. I, I, don't, I don't condone 
Facebook or, or Google profiles or whatever they are, Google Plus or whatever, uh, as you know, saying, oh, you should all make sure you have a Facebook account or whatever. I, I think that's a personal choice and you can decide. Uh, LinkedIn is one thing, though, that I believe in the professional world is very common and it's something that is expected of people. And you as students right now have an opportunity to get started on yours and at least keep it fairly up to date. And uh, I'm going to encourage you to spend a little bit of the time today to actually start yours if you don't already have one. If you already have one, it's no big deal. Um, this is uh, a way of basically creating an online resume. Uh, if you're looking for a job, you can refer to this. It has basic information about yourself, right? who you are, what you do, etc. It has, much like a resume, uh, the kinds of things that you do. In my case, here's some of the classes that I've taught. Uh, and whatever, you know, awards, publications, et cetera, okay, school, that sort of thing, okay? This will be one of the addresses that you're going to want to update your, your digital tools profile with, and I'm going to show you how to do that in a little bit. So I want you to work on creating a LinkedIn profile as part of today. That's under step uh, four, okay? Under part five, I'm going to ask you to do a flavors.me page. And so you're going to go to flavors.me. And I will tell you, Flavors has trouble sometimes when everybody tries to do it all at once. And you know, big surprise, right? Um, particularly because it's all coming from the same geographic location. And so when you're creating it, just be patient, and it will eventually happen. Um, but you can come here, click on Start Your Website. <laughs> okay, so we're apparently not going to do this at all today because you know I, I go to flavors and I'm like, oh yeah, sure, start your website. Did I actually click on it? No, right? It's experiencing issues. So, such is life, right? That's okay. We will skip that part. Okay. Um, if it comes back, I'll have you do it. If not, it, it is what it is. I'm just curious. I have to keep trying. Um, and then under part six, at least you'll have your LinkedIn profile. And I'm going to show you that part of it. So you're going to go back to your dashboard on the course website. And you're going to go to uh, your, sorry, I'm in, my, I'm in the admin console here. So um, So I get everything. You know what? Hold on a second. Let me log into the what it looks like for you. Okay. So if I go to my dashboard, so much cleaner, right? I'm going to go to profile. And under profile, you'll see down here that I have the ability to go first name, last name, etc. with my email. But then I can put in a website. This is where your Flavors website was supposed to go if they were working. right? But you also have the ability to put in your LinkedIn profile. Okay? So my address is linkedin.com slash in slash Grant A. Adams. Right? And I've put that into my LinkedIn uh, or into this profile. And then I've clicked Update. And what happens is when I create a post, let me go look at one of my posts here. Right, here was the post that I created last class. Next to my post, I get this little bit about the author. And you see that I have these little buttons below my name, right? one of which is my LinkedIn profile. If I were to click on it, it would take me to my LinkedIn profile. Right? So Google, when it crawls the site and looks for information, will associate this content with my name and my LinkedIn profile. So you see how it's all starting to build the same thing? Right? It's building my online identity together. So we want to make sure that we update that so that your, when you're making your posts, uh, you will have the ability to, to have these same little links. Uh, in my case, the, the home button here would take me to the flavors page. right? And so here's our, our flavors page. There we go. Um, if you were able to create it, you would do the, the, obviously the same thing. And I apologize uh, for this not working, but again, it's outside of my control and, and such is life. Of course, it would be my luck that it wouldn't work when you guys were supposed to do it. But it is what it is. At least you're going to do the, the LinkedIn profile okay, and get started on that. 
Uh, if you already have your LinkedIn profile, that's fine. Um, I have to look up my password uh, to sign in to LinkedIn so I can show you the back end. So this is one of those disadvantages when I'm using a password manager on the school computer, not my own computer. I have to actually do this. The cool thing is, so here it is on my phone, not that you can see this, right? And I can say, yeah, let me just unlock it with my thumbprint. And I don't actually have to type in, it doesn't like me. Let me use my right thumb instead. Yeah, it likes me. And then I have access to it, right? And I can go to LinkedIn and say, oh, yeah, there it is. And there's my password. And it reveals, obviously, I'm not going to turn it around and show it to you. <laughs> yeah, here it is. No. Uh, so I can go ahead and go in. And I can go and type this. Oops. And now I can get into my actual LinkedIn account. And so once I'm in this, I'm going to click on Profile and then Edit Profile. And this is where I can start to edit the information about myself, right? Um, including you know, what my experience is, the kinds of things that I do, um, et cetera. And you see that now, obviously, it's all editable uh, as opposed to the uneditable version. It will give you a little profile strength indicator. You guys will start out at the bottom because you won't have that much content put in it yet. As you put more content in, that little bubble will fill up. Uh, the one other thing that I do want to point out is I've set it up so that I have a special address, linkedin.com slash in slash Grant A. Adams, as my address. Yours will not read as clean as that initially. It'll have some string of letters or something. You can go in using this little settings icon. And right here under your public profile URL, you can click the little pencil. And you can actually edit linkedin.com slash in slash something. And so if you can make that your name, all the better. It's nice and clean. Okay? And then you'll click Save, and that will then be your actual profile. So I would encourage you to do that as well. Makes it easier to, to give to somebody uh, and to look at. Okay? So I would say spend the next 10, 15 minutes or so working on your LinkedIn profile. Then go ahead and come in here and update your uh, digital tools profile with your LinkedIn address. Okay? Because we can't seem to do the flavors page, um, you won't actually create a post today. In case I'm just curious if it came back or not. Nope. OK. So uh, such is life. Um, you won't actually create a post for today for your exercise 202, 102. Uh, but that's OK. Uh, it's no big deal. Obviously, you'll get credit for being here anyway. OK? Remember at 1030, sorry to beat you over the head with this, we're going to unlock the computers and get you all logged in. Okay, so we'll go through that stuff when it comes time. Are there any questions about any of this just yet? No? All right.